All right. Are we ready? Yes, we're ready. Yeah. Yeah, I got the analytics of play uh, using information visualization and gameplay practices for visualizing game data. And basically, the paper starts out by comparing analysts' work to play and uh, how the tracking of game data or play data has increased lots uh, lately. And it talks about they talk about how the you can compare like a child playing with uh, you know puzzles where you fit the square peg into the square hole, etc. And such to uh, analyzing and placing the dots on a uh, data point sets correctly. And he talks about that games kind of blur the line between play and the analysis of data itself. Because uh, you can make a game or metagaming out of just analyzing the data itself. And <clears throat> games, uh, they describe games as a medium uh, as play with data or uh, an activity using an assortment of data in a structured or unstructured playful fashion. Uh, and they try and define what play is, which we all know, I suppose, is very hard. And uh, we definitely talked about it in earlier courses here. Uh, and <clears throat> they kind of combine two different models for what play is. Um, one from some guy called K. Lois or something. I probably pronounced his name thoroughly wrong. Uh, and another uh, guy called Brown, I believe, yeah. And <clears throat> they look into the different uh, definitions of play that those two have and the difference and similarities between those two and uh, they conclude that uh, Brown looks at uh, the experience of play, what do you experience when you play and the k uh, definition looks more of the form of play, like how is it played and in the paper there is uh, graph thing uh, there uh, that compares the two different models and the similarities and at the bottom the uh, main difference where uh, Kaloys uh, says that as soon as play ends it's separated from the real world and you sort of forget about it but uh, Brown talks more about the continuation of desire where you actually want to keep playing and uh, the experience of that. Um, yeah. uh, okay, I kind of lost track of where I was. One second. <laughs> yeah. And the main point sort of, of this is that they want to use the definitions of play to see how uh, the form and experience of play can affect the information visualization that I want to do, like how can we visualize game data uh, based on this definition. And they then go on and talk about the fact that a good analyst will have to be playful, which is what you can see on the right there is that you need the playful traits of being interested, curious, self-motivated, open-minded, and flexible and imaginative if you want to uh, be a playful analyst. And that these having these traits as an analyst can help you in different ways. Uh, it can give you just external motivation for or extrinsic motivation for working further with a data set even after you've first found your initial insight, what you want to look for, you can, if you're 
playful with it. You can just sit down and play with the data and actually find an extrinsic motivation to keep working and analyzing the data and explore it deeper than normal normal analysts would do. Um, and then they want to talk. They go on to talk about the different kinds of uh, casual information information visualization, and uh, which they split into different categories. Um, but generally, it means that it's computer-mediated tools, and to depict personally meaningful uh, information in some visual ways, uh, which are different categories they mention are ambient information visualization, social information visualization, they short it to infovis, and artistic info visualization. Uh, they, they have uh, different things. They kind of uh, view <coughs> their kind of for different things, really, different categories of games and new visualization. Uh, as you can see, aim ambient info wish systems uh, include raw data and might not be productive to interpret, but it could be meaningful to a single player. And uh, the artistic info wish is more of a thing where you can you try and depict the data artistically, so it looks nice and nice graphs and everything like that. And social is where you analyze the information visualization in a way so you can look into your social networks and it's, it's usually, uh, they talk about how it's not always useful for other people than you yourself to actually analyze your own social network. You, other people might not find any meaning in it, but you might find interest in it, uh, <clears throat> even if only casually. Um, because they feel like there's a category lacking here, which is kind of what the rest of the paper is about. They want to introduce the playful info with, where you have uh, the category uh, promotes play through information visualization. So you use the information, the graphs, and whatever the data metrics to uh, use it for play. Um, <clears throat> and then we're to player types, in which they uh, differentiate. Uh, again, the two definitions they use, because they then fall back to Calloy's and Brown's definitions where Calloy, Hylois, uh separates uh, into four different groups of gaming. Uh, chance games, competition games, simulation games, and vertigo games. And each of the game categories has an axis of structured to unstructured play. So for example, for chance, an unstructured chance game is uh, flipping a coin and structured uh, chance game is in playing in the casino or casino games. And Brown has quite a different category uh, for play types. And they kind of combine thing aspects from both Brown and Kylos throughout the paper. And uh, Brown places categorizes players in eight different categories, which are artist or creator, collector, competitor, director, explorer, kinesthite, uh, storytellers, and the joker. And yeah. the obviously, as with every player type, they will try to, uh, what should I say, group what kind of player likes different things. Like for example, uh, they, one of the examples they use is players making maps in uh, World of Warcraft or uh, participating in creating online databases such as uh, Wowhead and stuff like that. 
they talk about how players can find meaning in play in its own of actually collecting all the data and sharing it with others, which is what most of these online databases are, are just player created communica communities with uh, everything from maps and locations of everything in pretty much every game these days has one of these databases or wiki pages. Um, yeah. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, and they especially use uh, map making from World of Warcraft as an example. There's an image of it a bit more about um, there, where you have uh, different player categories and such enjoying uh, making these maps. And, uh, and they kind of talk about how data analysis tools have been added to almost any any game and even game development itself. Um, I think it was is it Bioware that had the tool uh, where you uh, they tracked all the you did as a game developer, all the work you did, how many bugs you sold, how many issues you sold, and things like that. And the they added the meta gaming system on top, so you could actually have playful competition from the data itself. So the data itself creates a kind of play um, that you can do. And you can, you can see examples of this uh, everywhere, and that's kind of what everything else the rest of the paper shows is different communities such as Darkfall and Evil Line, see all the pictures here, and where players uh, create political maps and just use data from the game to create systems outside the game to enable or uh, increase the enjoyment of the play itself. And most of the rest of the paper is about different systems that enable this, such as uh, the data cracker thing if they have for dead space, and the auto log system that are in place for need for speed. And yeah, they have like lots and lots and lots of examples of different systems that enable this. FIFA, Skynet, yeah, etc. <laughs> And that's pretty large chunk uh, of the paper is talking about how these systems can enable competition and uh, how they enable the game to increase in size purely based on the fact that you have data tracking systems for achievements, for races played, for how many races you won. And if you scroll down a bit, you have the autolog system, which tells you a lot about uh, someone just beat you uh, three days ago. You need to get back in the game and beat him because he had this in his time. And, uh, just, it gives you another level of gaming, uh, which you can see in a lot of games. If you play a lot online, you have uh, Assassin's Creed, I think it is, a uh, web battle there where you can go and compare yourself to other players and see its stats. And you kind of want to get motivation from just the data itself that you can beat someone else as data and yeah, they have plenty of systems that show this. Uh, you have player dossiers which are generated from, you, they have giant bomb, Bungie, there are plenty of sites like this, for example I think Raptor is one that's being used quite a lot now, which they don't mention in the paper but I know that it exists and uh, it's probably not the only one. There's probably lots and lots and lots of these sites, and it just shows that uh, analysis and use of data from games and metric systems can be used for a lot uh, within gaming itself, not for necessarily for, should I say, scientific purposes and measuring data for measuring data and so look at what you do, but you can actually use the data to create uh, a larger game without actually creating a larger game because it enables metagaming and competition outside the game. And yeah, uh, I think that's about what I have to say. Pretty much the rest of the paper is just describing the different systems. Uh, yeah, and, and 
the thing you have here that is kind of talk about what the kind of systems, how they fill out in the different sets of the categories they took from Kaloids and Brown. And yeah, what you kind of like or not. I don't feel like I have much more to say. I've kind of forgotten the last page, I think. But One of the, the, the questions I have um, is they don't mention like the ethics of doing this playful data analysis. Yeah. Um, and uh, they don't really go through what data you should collect versus what data you can collect and whether that actually matters. Um, and if you know, if it's just the game, is it therefore okay to keep anything you like, or might there be some rules? Um, and I, I, to some extent, comes from that kind of very American, very liberal view on what businesses are allowed to do, um, which wouldn't fly very well in Norway, I don't think. Um, but yeah, I know they they talk about this playfulness of data analysis um, and how they like to play with data. Um, do you think that their joy with playing with data is actually a different player type? Sorry, what was the last sentence? Do you think that there is a specific player type that likes playing with data? Uh, I'd probably imagine so. Uh, I'm pretty sure not everyone enjoys uh, playing with it and actually sitting down and doing analysis and for example in uh, what yeah you keep talking. I was thinking for example in World of Warcraft uh, and probably a lot of online MMO games there's just the type of player that really enjoys doing all the theory crafting and uh, actually crunching all the data and the numbers to find the best spec, to find the best gear, to find everything. And I think that's kind of the same type that would enjoy, uh, you know, uh, doing the data analysis elsewhere. One of the interesting things with um, showing people, doing beta data analysis, um, is for example, if you show people lottery tickets, and win loss ratios and overall income and you show them enough data and you visualize it in particular ways they stop enjoying the, the game right because it, it's partly the not having information is one of those things that is part of the game for them. um I, I find this myself when i do things like i explain how rainbows work Right? And there's a bunch of people who don't want you to explain how a rainbow works. Mm -hmm. right? They don't want a data visualization of a rainbow. They they, they just want it to be pretty. Um, and and I think there's you, you could almost say that rather than, than saying data analysis is is a kind of game you can play, I think it's actually almost a player type. Um, I've we've just had a cricket test, right? And test match cricket is um, often associated with statistics and there are a bunch of people who watch American baseball for the statistics and they just love getting in and finding out all the particular batting averages and pitching averages and all and, and the same for cricket. They, they they love the little numbers and the analysis and they love all this data visualization that um, other people can't just don't understand why anybody would be interested. So do you think there's actually a, a, a different motivator? that they could have used rather than saying, oh, here are these ones, here's what we do, look at how they overlap, is should they have said, well, actually, it might be a different category entirely for people like us. There very well might be, and it would have made sense to me. Uh, yeah. I, I think... What about the rest of us? What, what do you guys think about, about people who like playing with us? I know I like it. <laughs> if there's statistics, I'll be all over it. Yeah, I'm so happy. It's, uh, awesome. Yeah, and 
uh, as they kind of show in the paper as well. Uh, a lot of games now come with systems either built in or created by player communities itself that let you anal analyze your data if you want to. Or if you finish a match in some game and you get all these statistics and graphs of how you did and when it started to go bad and you get all these. It's uh, really awesome to just analyze it and see what did you do wrong or when did this and this happen. And because um, obviously what would be interesting would be to say, do people who like playing with data um, perform differently in other areas of life? So for example, I would have a hypothesis that, that players who use those analytical tools and who play with visualization and play with data viz, um, may actually do better in academic life mm -hmm. than people who aren't looking for any deeper understanding or deeper analysis. Um, so it, it may be that, that you could actually say university students are more likely to look at data visualization and be interested in it yeah. than the average player. Um, or maybe not, I don't know, that would be a hypothesis you could test mm -hmm. by looking at um, who uses those tools uh, and surveying them about their demographic information. Um, have they gone to university, what level career do they have, those sort of things. It is at least an advantage to like numbers and statistics if you want to do research, kind of. <laughs> yeah. I think they, they, this certainly appeals to researchers, right? Because researchers are supposed to want to kind of find out more numbers and rearrange them and make them look interesting to convey a message. These guys are just doing it because it's fun rather than specifically for a message. Yeah. Shall we go on to the questions? Yep, I think we should go and check the questions. Um, let me find it. So. Um, yeah, so question one is how can game data give different player types higher enjoyment of a game? So Hannah, Hannah was telling us a little bit about it because you can reflect on it and so on. Any other um, ideas? For certain player types, I mean, mm. they just yeah. knowing the uh, player data, you can actually go and check how you do things. People, some play types will actually find enjoyment in just checking, oh, there is an achievement for him to, uh, and you can look into how you can do it, and then you go do it and you can feel fulfillment. While other player types, perhaps it's borders, uh, the profit testers, and will not find enjoyment from that because they can't export itself. Mm -hmm. so, there is differences from player types and what type of data you would like to look at as well, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, so the, the question, as, as Simon was also saying, can be turned around. It could be, you know, displeasure, not enjoyment, the, the, the reversal could occur for some player types with the amount of data which, you know, might not... All the spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> what are the main similarities and differences between color and brown properties of play? I don't know how to pronounce his surname either, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what are the main he's French and he's from the 1960s. So he probably wears a beret and smoked a lot, um, and probably wants his name pronounced in a particularly French way. So do we have any French students here at the moment? No. No. Okay. Well, we won't. We won't be embarrassing anybody by pronouncing it that badly. <laughs> Yeah, so what are the main similarities and the main differences? 
how they defined play. So what was the common thing? Play is something that is free and voluntary, that we don't have to do it. Yes. It's something we do voluntarily. And it's kind of purposeless. It doesn't really have a purpose of itself, uh, mm -hmm. a productive kind of that both agree on. Mm -hmm. So it has to be voluntary and... It's not for any specific purpose. purpose. But uh, that brown guy says that it still is necessary to be happy and <laughs> so it's, yeah. Yeah, they kind of have some similarities to yeah. run out quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, one just says that uh, they're loyal or whatever, uh, says it has to be make believe, while brown says that it's as long as you just split it from time, you kind of forget the time and place you are. You, just, you can sit and play like, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, damn, it's 10 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, conscious of self. And uh, while the main difference is they kind of don't agree much on the fact that games are, as soon as you stop playing the game, you just forget all about the game. For, there is no more game. You're no longer a pirate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of where they differ the most, other than the fact that uh, Brown kind of looks at the experience of play, while Halo looks at the form of play. Mm -hmm. So they kind of don't try to find exactly the same thing. They have a, bit, they, they have a different angle on approaching the problem. And I think there's like 70 years or something between when they actually did these moments. Mm -hmm. It could probably be combined in some in one model if you really wanted to. I think we've got plenty of different play models, but none of them are really accurate enough. Mm -hmm. So much, so hard to really define play. Yes, both of them are kind of correct, but also then sometimes not correct, and it's. And you. you, you it doesn't really matter which model you choose, you're always going to exclude something that you would actually find as play, and then the model gets really large. So the whole purpose of the model is to simplify, to use and exclude some mm -hmm. of the characteristics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why I think it's important to uh, be focused on what more are the phenomenon they're going to be explaining or understanding. Yes, so, so the question becomes how do, you, how do you measure the quality of a model? Right? Because um, if you just come up with any, you can come up with, with any differentiation or any model or any um, suggestion of, of player types or, or um, player motivations. Um, how, how would you measure that one is better than the other? I know I have some ideas, but what do you guys think? Think what, what would make one model better than another, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, is, is there mm -hmm. is, what, what might be characteristics that you could evaluate your quality of your model? Perhaps uh, how broad the model attempts to be. Uh, if it's too broad, it it might lose some of its uh, reliability uh, if it's clearly defined. Okay, so one of the things you've got there is reliability, which is one of the issues you've suggested. So um, it's reliability, and by reliability, do you mean repeatability? So that if two people use it, they put the same people in the same categories. Mm. Is that kind of is that kind of a repeatability reliability that you mean? How repeatable the categorization is. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, when, we, when we're looking at, at um, doing marking sets, one of the things we look at is, is if you have uh, good questions and, and appropriate marking, um, then the marks are repeatable. And uh, if you mark the same person uh, a while later, you get the same marks for the thing. Um, and so for a model, uh, if you're trying to model 
uh, why people play games. Yes. If you test a person and then you test them a week later, do you end up with them in the same part of the, the same categorization? Right? It, it does a person consistently behave in the same way that you're predicting, or is it kind of completely independent? And that would be an issue with reliability. Yeah, one day they're in one part of the model, another day they're in a completely different area. Mm -hmm. So, what else might be interesting metrics for a for a model of play? Just in general, what would make a good model? Mm -hmm. Rather, not would make what would not. Yeah, it, it, so it's not what would make a good model. It's how would you evaluate a model to be good, mm -hmm. or and therefore try and give it a, a value compared to other other models. Probably good to compare them with other models that are that also are mm -hmm. tested and. That's a question. How do you tease it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. You guys are going to become a scientist, so you should be interested in how you tease it. We've been imagining for so doing that, but. Anything from the background? I can't see you guys. You're up on the big screen. Well, it would have to be more um, observe, more observation of players in various ways, uh, and try to match it up okay. with the uh, um, models and. So that would that would become does does is is there a good match between the model and observations of a, a in a different um, a different type of observation or a different um, medium to assess them right so if if you're talking about you know, curiosity or something are, are they are they objectively curious um, do they um, if you eliminate some parts of the model um, does it predict a change in the player behavior. Um, so in, in science, we generally go things that one of the things we look at is predictive power. Is um, what does your model tell you about people, and what does it allow you predict about people? Because you can't predict anything, then you know it's not that useful to know if you don't know what's going to happen in the future, um, or it doesn't help you work out what's going to happen. So, um, so yeah, that ability to, to match it with observations. And then also make predictions about what might happen. Look at the validity or so of the model. Does it mm -hmm. actually predict and measure what you think it does? Yes. It would be interesting to have games where you can see some of the, where you have choices that kind of match up with your model, and you can see how people choose and. Uh, uh, and how they like it. There are some games, that some new MMOs that allow you to choose these uh, big parts of um, where everything you do is uh, for, for example, exploration based or uh, various things. And you can see how people choose and uh, how they like it and uh, how that would relate to your models. And I think it's important to be aware of what kind of games you test with. Maybe mm. find good games that uh, that allow players to choose a lot of different play styles. Yes, I was. Um, I was actually uh, one of one of my friends, uh, Ernest Adams, um, is a game designer, and um, uh, he's um, on his Facebook post. He has Richard Bartle as one of his friends, who will occasionally make comments on Ernest's posts. And it was interesting; they were discussing play styles. And uh, they were actually discussing in the posts uh, griefing. Is griefing a uh, play style, and is it a category of appropriate gameplay, or is it outside gameplay and therefore should be eliminated from games? Because Ernest hates griefers. 
we hate people who are trying to break the game just to break the game. Uh, whereas kind of Richard Bartle said, well, you know, that's why my player types only work for MMO games. And I, yeah, I don't have Grievous in my, <laughs> in it. Um, but no, there was this interesting discussion on, on do, do griefers who are trying to break the game, are they part of the game or are they separate? <laughs> Speaking of griefers, <laughs> have you seen the uh, Twitch plays Pokemon these days? <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah? Uh, have, you, have you seen that? Uh, they, they put up on Twitch a serious streaming site. And they have a bot that reads the chat inputs, so you can write left, right, up, down, A, B, and you play Pokemon. And there's basically 50 to 70,000 players spamming just A, B, 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 A, left, right, left, right, left, left, right. <laughs> and probably about half of them are just spamming star, 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 or B, 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 try and destroy it for everyone else. They disabled it after Yeah, I think they did. So they've kind of just tossed out all their Pokemon and every, all the assets in the inventory and kind of hilarious to look at when there's 50,000 people all trying to write them off, probably with some delay as well to move one character around on the screen. And it doesn't really work well. Sometimes they get stuck for six hours in just a corner because someone's always trying to move them up to the corner. <laughs> and that's kind of griefing and people find a lot of fun in doing that. I don't really get it, but people do. And it's kind of hilarious to look at. It. Uh, I think they've actually got like five badges now. So yes, it's halfway it's, I don't game. know how they did it, but it's hilarious to watch. Well, someone, uh, <laughs> I read a comment about it. Someone compared it to, you know, the million monkeys and the million tapirates will write right Shakespeare. <laughs> and then someone said that, well, this is more like a million monkeys. Uh, on bottom typewriter, <laughs> and half of them are trying to smear shit all over the typewriter. Fun art was kind of funny. Kind of interesting to look at. It's just put Google and you can see it. Yeah. And it's, uh, one of the interesting things is is um, when you look at at Carus's definitions from the 1960s, he doesn't really take griefers as a gaming category. Right, because um, the one of the things you uh, that often happens with griefers is they're anonymous. It's very hard to be anonymous in a traditional game, right? So either in a in a sporting event or in a board game or in a card game, because you don't have a medium with which through which you're playing the game, um, people know who you are, right? If you're coming in and and um, playing football against someone. Um, they can look you in the face. They see you, right? Um, I mean, the, 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 I suppose the only area where this happened was in like the, the faked wrestling, where people put on a mask to try and hide their identity. But um, greeting doesn't happen much in traditional games because mm -hmm. if someone throws their toys, they just walk out and leave. Um, but in computer games, there's a whole bunch of new categories of ways of playing and of types of play that just had never been thought of in the 30s for um, Hertzinger or, or in the 60s for Kilowit. Um And I think some people who analyze games also don't think about that full range of, of people who might be playing. They kind of stick with the traditional ways of thinking about games. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, no, I think grie griefers are an interesting subcategory that usually get missed out. Um, or ha have been missed out by a number of researchers. Yeah. Right, let's have a look where we are at the questions. So we uh, discussed discuss the similarities and differences, but also wandered off a little bit into discussing models in general. Um, so what are the different types of causal information visualization and what systems do they correspond to and display an inherent quality? No. That's kind of a complicated question. There are three categories. Yep. They have three different systems that correspond to it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
categories that was as I said earlier are uh, artistic, ambient, and social influence, and they want to add with the fourth one, which is playful influence. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what to add that to incorporate the gameplay uh, into it? Mm -hmm. One of the main points uh, they say is that play is not an intricate quality of the existing models. Uh, they kind of don't allow much for play. Um, those types of player, but uh, they don't really show any good examples of you know, people use these, so, so it's a little bit abstract. Mm -hmm. They say, yeah, uh, it visualizes social networks, but what do they mean by that? Do they mean uh, a graph of how many friends do you have? Mm -hmm. or, you know, there are many examples. I was also a little bit uh, confused with the domains they've chosen because initially I thought they wanted the data visualization to be playful, but they've used the games as a source of the data, so that playfulness was not yeah. about visualizing the data, it was actually the data itself. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the word play was m used from both of those ends. In, in a way. And I, I feel like one of the main points is that data is allowing metagaming. Yes. Any ga any data, not necessarily gaming data. Yeah. Yep. So the next one is what is Hello, classification of games. Explain this classification. Well, we kind of talked about it with question two. There's some overlap between those two. Um, what is an autolog system in a gameplay? The autolog system is, I'm pretty sure, it's, uh, the need for speed system. It is called autolog. Yep, so. Mm -hmm. Which is, should I explain it as? It tracks all your data and all your friends and that's what all your friends are doing and then kind of recommends what you do based on your friends and vice versa. And then, uh, that's kind of what they, they try to use the data to motivate to play more, I suppose, uh, and to play things that they think you might like. Uh, they have a pretty similar system in SSX, I think, that uses, I think it is built on some artificial neural network, which in the background kind of looks like the person learns what kind of player you are, recommends races, and what you played and what you like. Mm -hmm. yep. So yeah, we talked talk a little bit about it at the beginning, that it might be easier to find similarities between preferences. So instead of having a model, you just find who you are similar to, and then make predictions and or recommendations based on the predictions um, of choices of the other person. Uh, so without having a model, you can still make some meaningful suggestions or recommendations or uh, inspire you to compete based on your similar peers doing certain decisions. Uh, yep. All right, I think that's that that's it for the for the articles. Um, next week we will talk about your projects and you will have a short presentation about the state of the work and what your goals are and what your research questions are and where, where you're going with the projects and a little bit of an update of, of where you are at, at, at the moment. Um, yeah.
and I believe there's a deadline for credit reporting that. Work done. And indeed, there is a deadline for progress report. Is for progress report. Sunday, I believe. 23rd. 23rd February. It's mentioned in this uh, lecture sound. Yes. Yeah, it's on Sunday, Sunday, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. Sunday. Sunday. Progress report on Sunday, 23rd of February, indeed. And uh, as we were saying, um, also start coming up with suggestions for papers that you will be including or want to be included that we should cover in the lectures after next week. And how many papers would be mine? Let's start with three suggestions from me. I think we've got a, quite a bunch of now that we could use. Yeah. I mean, there's we could, uh, if you have more that you, that you would like to suggest, then uh, just more. But at least three, we have, we have a possible choose. Yep. We could do it, I suppose, yeah. Mm, no, per person. Because each of you will be presenting a paper. So you should be individual. Makes sense. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon? Yes. 